Ding, 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 ding. Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of geographically challenged friends explore movies through trivia as an excuse to keep their friendships alive. I'm one of these friends and today's host, Nick, and with me is... Tom. And KJ. Great to have you back as always. Additionally, joining us as a guest for this episode is... Ross. Thanks for joining us today, Ross. Ross and KJ taught together in Japan where Ross used to grace the apartment complex by playing a resonator guitar. Also, for New Year's in 2008, Ross and KJ found themselves in a stranger's house dressing up in old-timey Japanese garb. Ross also conveniently likes movies. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with a movie quiz, which consists of two rounds of questions to determine who will earn today's trivia crown. Then, once the fierce competition is over, we follow it up with our famous movie rant, Where Anything Goes. Today's movie was suggested to us by KJ. We will be jumping into the sci-fi thriller film, Infinity Chamber by Travis Malloy, who is also known for one other film called Street Gun. Infinity Chamber had a very small limited theater release. It was on streaming services the following day. But if you did leave your couch and venture into the theater at that time, you could have also seen Sully, Kubo and the Two Strings, the Ben-Hur remake, or Bridget Jones' Baby. KJ, I'm going to turn this over to you. Tell us a little bit about the plot summary and why you thought this would be a fun one to discuss today. Infinity Chamber is a low-budget sci-fi film about Frank, who is trapped in a prison with only a computer to talk to. Throughout the movie, we find out that the prison can be used to examine the prisoner's memories, and we revisit a particular memory from Frank, which has him in a coffee shop talking with the barista, Gabby. Eventually, Frank figures out how to trick the computer he shares a cell with, and he escapes to go find the actual coffee shop. Let's be clear. This is not a good movie, but I'm a sucker for these smaller sci-fi films with just a few characters that try to say something. I also feel like we have access to so many good movies these days. If you don't watch a few bad ones, your scale is going to be off and you're going to start thinking good movies might be bad because you're comparing them to the best movies. So I always like to, you know, throw in, well, throw in Infinity Chamber sometimes. Um, But what I liked about this one is it doesn't resolve itself um i don't think we'll find out maybe we'll explore that in this episode um and it also does a lot with very little um i also have a lot of dreams where i wake up in a room with only a computer for a companion and have to figure out how to get out of the situation so movies like this really give me hope what do you think tom well this is kind of a reference to a conversation kj and i had offline um i i will say i agree with you kj this is not a particularly good movie this is uh God, what would you go? This is this is a like B-roll film right here, you know, something that um, they used to put in the theaters, kind of like monster movies that they used to put in theaters. But now you just release it right to streaming, and you probably actually produce a lot more of them. However, you know, when we approach movies on this podcast, it's it's kind of like there's there's two prongs to that fork. There's one of them, which is what is the value judgment we're assigning this film. Um, is it good? Is it bad? And and why? Uh, the other thing is, what kind of information or discussion does the film generate, independent of its value judgment or the, you know its value as a a work of art or a work of entertainment? Um, and I think that we kind of come to the conclusion that um, you know pop pop culture and especially science fiction in pop culture. The, these things can philosophize. They can g- generate thought, even if they're, you know, maybe not the the best performances. Actually, didn't really mind the main actor in this, um, or if the uh, if the whole thing feels like a little stilted or bumpy or looks just generally ugly, like the aesthetic of the film. Still, there's the possibility of exploring thought and and kind of you know maybe deep concepts even if you assume they're there. And in assuming they're there, you can have a lot more fun kind of discussing these movies. And so that that's, was kind of my approach to this was, you know, um, what ideas about consciousness and, and like freedom of the mind and things like that are, are being projected out of this film? Nick, what do you think? Well, what I will disclose here is this was quite the, the photo finish uh, of a movie for me for this episode. I had a very challenging week. But I buckled down and made sure I, I watched the whole thing. Had a little bite to eat with uh, apparently a, a very hard 
apple cider that was soaked in bourbon barrels. I think it actually qualifies as apple wine due to the 10.5% alcohol content. So I think I'm in the perfect mode and mood to discuss this film. Uh, going back to what KJ was talking about it, he shared in his plot summary the word escapes. I, I think we're going to explore that a little further in this episode. And what I like about these movies, even if it isn't a great movie, I did think that this was one that would evoke some interesting conversation and analysis, just like Tom said, if there really is something deeper for us to pick at here. And I'm going to go with the assumption that there is. And I think it'll be a, a fun one to explore. But I will say, just because I recently watched this movie, that should not create any expectation that I am going to get any of these questions right today. But I'm going to do my best. Ross, what are your initial thoughts? I actually enjoyed the movie a lot more than I initially expected I would. Um, to be honest, I chose the movie because I do love this type of genre. I'm, I'm quite into dystopian, futuristic um, films, a big fan of the Black Mirror series um, and anything to do with sort of technology gone wrong. But uh, it, uh, similarly to some of the things that you guys have already said, it did make me really quickly start to consider things like um, human consciousness, um, the interplay between memories and imagination. And I thought, even though, you know, this had a bit of a Groundhog Day feel without being quite as funny, um, it did evoke, yeah, it didn't resolve itself and it did evoke some, I thought, some pretty deep thoughts. And I'm sure we're going to explore that further in the questions and rants to come. But of course, Ross, we cannot continue without a critical point of our episode where we ask the guests what they think is the best snack to either eat or imbibe while watching Infinity Chamber. What do you think? Uh, for me, it would have to be um, a little bit of hometown loyalty, an Australian snack called a Tim Tam. But you can take it one step and I would go for something called the Tim Tam Slam. So for those of you who are not educated on Tim Tams, they are an Australian, uh, something halfway between a confectionery bar and a cookie. It's like a chocolate biscuit coated in dairy milk chocolate. It's got a cream center. It's a sort of a rectangular shape. And if you take a careful small bite from two opposing corners, diagonally opposite, uh, you can create a straw of sorts with which you can slurp some of your hot beverage of choice through the biscuit and you'll feel the instant that that biscuit starts to collapse and you've got to put the whole thing in your mouth and it's gone in one go. Um, it's pretty full on. It's pretty intense, but it would be my recommendation. I feel like we should have flown them over to us for this episode. That sounds delicious. It's time for movie quiz. In this episode of talking pictures trivia, we're going to have two rounds of questions. The first round, each question be worth one point. There are three questions, and the categories are the amenities, the term, and the jailer. Ross, where would you like to start? Oh, I would like to start with the amenities, please. It's time for question one. What is Howard's primary protocol? Locked in. Locked in. Locked in. All right, Ross, what do you got? His primary protocol is to keep frank alive okay and nick keep him alive and tom it's, he says keep him alive until he is processed wow very specific tom yes um and that that is the complete answer um points for everybody so yeah the the howard is the computer that's in the room with frank and he's not exactly dodgy but he doesn't seem to answer he's very selective on what questions he'll answer and how he answers them um, and he repeats pretty often that his primary objective is to keep Frank alive. Um, how do you guys feel about uh, Howard compared to other computers and other movies? Do you mean Hal? <laughs> He's pretty much their <laughs> version of Hal from you know 2001: A Space Odyssey. I think he did his what he was supposed to do. I feel like he was certainly channeling a KJ vibe. If I close my eyes when I listen to Howard speaking to Frank, I actually thought <laughs> I was listening to you, KJ. What, his repetitive and redundant phrases? <laughs> <laughs> Ross, would you like some coffee? I do not have that information. <laughs> <laughs> I can play some music. Yeah. <laughs> I have a good selection of jazz. And... 
Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, Howard Howard is the Howard constructs the world and the consciousness of of our main character, right? Frank Lerner. What ex- happens to him is he's sort of in this like Descartes demon type thing where he's he's dropped into a false consciousness, a false reality that's being generated, you know, not exactly by Howard, but by the machinery that Howard is a part of. He's like a dull God, right? He's like a dumb God. He doesn't know anything or how to do anything other than create a world for Howard to occupy. Uh, you know, so the the stability or the um, the externality of Frank's consciousness, the fact that Frank could exist outside of these these worlds that Frank that uh, Howard generates, um, you know, Frank really can't get that information because of Howard. And simultaneously, Howard is really too stupid to help him out of that situation, or he's his programming doesn't allow it. And so he has this kind of like a dumb god that, that you know shapes the the consciousness and the experiences that you know these kind of subjective experiences that that frank has i don't want to jump too deep into some of my uh thoughts about this movie through what i'm about to say because uh, it might really take us down a rabbit hole too early but we're also making an assumption that howard is that stupid machine and my interpretation, and I, again, I, I don't want to just like just splurge all my information or what's in my head on this. Uh, I want to kind of see where the questions take us. But is that an act or is that fulfilling a purpose? Because my vision and what I want to explore with you guys later is the ending of this movie. Um, I don't know if he is as dumb as we think the machine is or if it has an ulterior uh, structure to pull out the information it inevitably wants. I'm kind of talking cryptic because I don't know where the conversations are going to take us. But I, again, through the whole movie, I think everything you're saying is true. But I kind of had an epiphany at the end, which may or may not be true or relevant or up to interpretation. Without delving down that rabbit hole too far. Too, <laughs> We're all going to get there sometime, Ross. <laughs> too far, Nick. Yeah, I, I also did feel like... Um, uh, you're meant to understand before the main character does that Howard is AI, but there's also a really crucial um, scene where it flashes to a control room of sorts that's viewing viewing how uh, Frank's cell, and there's you know uh, you know it looks like an old school almost pilot's cockpit with a lever and buttons and things that suggest there might be someone physical controlling the AI watching. So it's this, this interplay of how much is this, is Howard actually just AI versus is there someone in the background pulling levers? The remaining categories are the term and the jailer. Tom, where would you like to go? The term. It's time for question two. This question is subjective. You will all give me an answer and I'll pick my favorite. How long do you think Frank was imprisoned? Locked in. Locked in? Locked in. All right, Tom, what do you have? I'm going to argue seven months. And the way we, my, my justification for my argument is the way we're given to understand time is that he's, first of all, under two metrics, two vectors. He develops a relationship with Gabby, first of all, and second of all, in the apartment in which she occupies in, in the dream state, we see plans, kind of uh, uh, plots to how this world is working. And I would say that most of the time that passes in which he's in the stream world, we don't experience it. We only see it as a montage. And I would say that it takes maybe about seven months to come up with the plan he came up with, but also to develop a very meaningful relationship with this woman. Um, I don't think it's much longer than that because the plan he comes up with isn't particularly complex. I'm not entirely sure why he needed all those papers on the wall. Um, but I, I do think that you would need at least that time to kind of develop the, the depth of relationship that seemed to be indicated by, by the two of them. I don't know if I'm giving away too many of my cards, but I believe he is still in jail. And I don't believe he did escape. 
Well, at the end of the movie, I believe when it, you know, we when we're led to believe that he's escaped, um, I, you know, there's some reference to a news article that I believe might talk about a two-year period, perhaps. Um, I might be wrong on that, but but there's enough there, I believe, to suggest that his final escape may well also be just another uh, simulation dream type scenario from which he will eventually just wake up again in the same jail cell. I I think Ross and I are in a very, very similar mindset when it comes to the ending sequences of this film. But if the context is what we're presented in the scenario of where he escaped, I, and I don't know how specific you want to be there. There was a, a news broadcast, and I, I can't remember if it was two to three years. It was a few years that they implied that they were in there. He was the sole survivor of 300 people that were imprisoned in this within this scenario. So, And to give some more context to that, he was – developing uh, a pattern of when the unit would be down for 12 seconds and that cycle happened every three months so it took a little bit of time for him to get into the rhythm of how long that cycle it wouldn't be like oh yeah because he had the pipe ready to go he had different things so a a series of time it could have been a year because he was he was developing that 12 seconds at a time that was his window so again I went all over the place from saying he's still there to the amount of time sequence. But I would say if we're looking at just the confines of assuming that he did get out, I believe it was two to three years, whatever that uh, broadcast was. Soul Survivor. All right. Points go to Tom. Um, I don't know how long he was there. Um, I, I think it could have been a very long time. I think it could have been 30, 40 years. As, as you guys- how did Tom get the points? Tom got the points because his reasoning, I think, was a little more sound. You guys pointed out that that news article, that news report, um, said a few years. I'm not sure that news report was real. Um, as you guys pointed out, I think that was just another mind manipulation, and that was a good amount of time to make him believe how long he was there, so that they could continue to, um, you know, probe his mind and, and figure things out. Um, but where where Tom's answer, he kind of stepped back and said it would have taken this long to either plan it, it wasn't a good plan. So so Tom Tom gets the points on that. I'm not sure we, we know the lower limit of how long he would have been there. Based on him having to develop that at 12 seconds at a time and needing a three month lag time in between, I, I think it must have been years. Uh, and the only reason I'm I'm thinking it had to be that two, three years is his, when you're in that simulation, when you're in that mind, all that data is fed through his mind. So if he knows that he's been somewhere for a few years, the story is going to come through. But again, this is completely open to interpretation. So Tom could be completely right. I just have a question. How do you know it's every three months? I don't remember that. There was a part when he was talking to Gabby where he said, it'll be three months before the next okay. cycle. And he said it was just a okay. little over 12 seconds. So the fact that he was able to get the, the pipe mm-hmm. out of the shower and do all that, assuming it, the timeline is based on reality, where KJ is saying maybe that is not the case, where timeline may not be based on reality. Maybe for, Heck, this could all happen in a day, and it's just a super fast loop for all we know. But based, if, if we, we have to make some assumptions, and my assumptions were different than yours, um, if we take those literal measurements out, it would have taken him at least a year or so to gather that data, to find, to take out that pipe within his 12 second window to set up the thing. That's just my opinion on that. So one of my, my criteria for not saying years and years and years, even though I think like somewhere in the, you know, six months to a few years makes sense, especially with what Nick was saying about three, you know, he has to learn how to count to 12, <laughs> not, not to count to 12, but the time, um, how long Howard is down for. Uh, the, I think the limit though is we don't really see him age, right? He's not in there long enough to mark aging. And for that to be the case where we, we don't see him age would mean that the entire picture is within his consciousness. And I, I don't think we have the evidence for that. I, I think in fact, the, uh, the play between an al- 
alternative consciousness or a plugged in consciousness and the room itself is is key to the film i'm actually going to highlight that there is actually a little bit of evidence towards that the jail that howard has him in may not be physical and may actually be mental so there's a chance that this may not actually be a physical prison but a prison within his own mind but uh, sure, I mean, I think it's it's implicit that he's a, a captive of his own his own consciousness, right? And, and Fletcher brings this up. Fletcher says that I I cannot stand it anymore. I don't know what's real or not. And so the real punishment of I don't know if it's punishment because it isn't intended to be punishment. It's intended to be interrogatory. They're trying to get information from Frank. But the punishment as they're experiencing it is the lack of control over what is conscious and what isn't. Um, It it would be as if to discover that the podcast we're doing right now is is a product of a dream or a product of one of our imagination or or of our imagination. So it seems like the prison of the mind is is there, but he's still also physically in prison. Well, see, this movie is open to interpretation because that Fletcher May may not have been physical. That's what I'm trying to say. Like there's different angles to look at this. And then the one that I'm posing for this just, you know, thought exercise is that he is not in a physical cube. Okay. He's in a cube in his brain and Howard, a machine is implanting these in because he goes in and out of the dream state to this prison state. Who's saying it's a physical prison and all the, and based on, and I think Ross was alluding to this too, we think he may still be in that state. Whereas the movie is showing that he may have escaped. I would say I need, I would need like a kind of some evidence to, to support the idea that we're not actually in that world. Well, Tom, some of the evidence might be that the, one of the big themes of the movie is memory and memory manipulation. And Mm -hmm. if I think back to different things, I mean, we talked about how Ross and I were in Japan in 08 and um, we, we found ourselves in a, in this, old guy's house and he had a bunch of costumes from i don't know you look like an old old ancient japan kind of guy and even now as i'm trying to remember that memory i don't think i picture myself from 10 years ago i don't know if i picture myself from now so them not showing um frank's aging it could just be his pov and his memory did he age did he not age i you know i'm not sure how specific that would have to be yeah, I went on a total tangent, and that's exactly why I was trying to say he wouldn't have aged if it's like uh, a Matrix kind of situation, you know? A, a thought did occur to me as I watched the second half of the film that I started to wonder if I was seeing some grey hairs on Frank or perhaps on his facial hair that I didn't. And I don't know if that's just because throughout the movies, does his facial hair grow out? I believe he's clean shaven. At the start, and there might be certain scenes where he does have um, uh, a bit of facial hair. I'm seeing a, a, some grey, and I don't know if that's just him as he would have been um, at the start of the film, or if that's an indication that time is is actually moving on while he's there. He is well groomed, but one could also imagine Howard is providing those the the razor and and shaving cream and the just for men, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, Final question of this round. The category is The Jailer. It's time for question three. How does Frank determine the nature of Howard? Locked in. Locked in. What does he do? Um, I'm going to say locked in. Okay, so I believe, I wish I could be more specific, but he asks a repeated question that gets the same answer back from Frank each time. So it's something like, uh, yes, Frank, uh, yes, Frank. Uh, he gets this sort of, sort of a simple question and he realizes that he's getting the same answer in a repetitive way that makes him realize it's AI and not, um, an actual person. Okay. My answer is exactly the same. Um, the repetitive question, he's getting the same thing back. It's not changing uh, direction. Yeah, he he says Howard over and over again. And um, what we see is Howard cycles through different intonations on how to say Frank, which are the same list of intonations that we we saw at the beginning of the picture. Exactly. Points for everybody. Yeah, um, 
Frank at, at some point says, Howard, yes, Frank, Howard, yes, Frank, Howard, yes, Frank. And I thought it was interesting that that repetition was the first time Howard got information that he could use to start taking down the system and, and start planning his escape. Um, and the, the reason I thought that repetition was interesting is because what Howard's doing to Frank is going into that memory over and over again with that repetition. There's a lot of repetition in this movie. And I feel that adds to the confusion of these memories or dreams. With Howard or in general? Uh, just in, in the whole movie, that, that, that all the beats that we see over and over and over again. Frank going to the, the, the cafe, um, Frank meeting... Him waking up each morning in bed. Him, yep, exactly. Him waking up, him meeting his dad, him waking up um, not only in the prison cell, but in his, his apartment. There was just a lot of repetition. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of Buddhist in some sense. I mean, there's this idea of um, this kind of cycle of living over and over and over again, this cycle of suffering over and over and over again. And through the, the you know, kind of the, these certain recognitions and, and certain um, means of divorcing the mind from body, you find liberation. Um, which is, you know, how this this movie, how, how liberation is found, right? He finds a way of getting out, which, you know, kind of allows him, uh, you know, liberation from suffering, liberation from, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, the world of the film. Um, and for me, the, the cycles rep didn't represent that, but they reminded me of that sort of Buddhist teaching, that suffering is something repeated over and over again until you could break the cycle and find liberation. I think the early cycles of the starting of the day cafe, they flipped pretty quickly through all that. And I thought that was a little confusing at first. And I, I didn't really take to it until it really got blatant to at the end where those scenes got a little bit more stretched out and he had more interactions with Gabby. It just, it, I, I didn't like the, the, just the pacing of that. And I get why they did it. But that was something else. And this is a, a, a bit of a tangent. I don't know if any of you guys picked it up, but there's something off with the sound of Gabby. She almost sounded like she was a voiceover. Like it, it had that feeling where if I was watching a forum film that was dubbed. So I don't know if that was intentional or just the equipment that they had to make this movie. I think it was her. Honestly, I think she was just, she was swallowing her words as she was saying them. It was, right. Yeah. That performance was rough. <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah, and I'm not I'm usually I'm the you. one that focuses on that aspect of movies, but it it just it sound it sounded like I was watching a dub film when she spoke. I, I just it, it, I just yeah, I'm right with you. Yeah. I, I felt the same way. Yeah. I felt like in terms of that the repetitive nature of those scenes in the film, they they did the amount of repetition that it would normally take to give you that feel and okay, this is a bit repetitive. And then they amped it up and they just kept going and kept going. So they actually really almost wanted you as the viewer to experience that monotony in a sense of waking up in the same place, repeating the same uh, events again and again. I thought that was actually- a Ross, he was successful. Yeah, it was effective, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Groundhog Day, the, the Bill Murray, Harold Ramis film, works in the same way. And, you know, from infinite reviews with, with Murray and Ramis, that the movie was intentionally this kind of um, kind of Buddhist allegory, right? Where you, you have to go through these different things, uh, first selfishness, then um, kind of self-destruction. And what ends up happening is he has to learn how to live the good life. This movie doesn't quite do that. What it seems to be more interested in is... Uh, not an analysis of why you're suffering. Why Frank is in this room seems not very important. I don't know if that's lack of skill on the filmmaker's part, but it just seems entirely secondary uh, as to why he's suffering, why he's in this room. What's important is getting out of the room. This is kind of this, this Buddhist phrase where it's, uh, you know, if the house is on fire, you don't think about analyzing where the fire came from. You look to get out of the house. And that's what I, I thought of that watching this. At the end of round one, uh, Ross and Nick each have two points and Tom's in the lead with three points. So it's still anybody's game. And um, we're going to try to get through these questions so we can speak freely. Sounds great, KJ. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. 
Talking Pictures Trivia Theater presents a screaming lapel pin production, The Jane of My Youth, a coming-of-age story of young love, read by me, Tom. Episode 4, The Hallway. He walked, footfalls echoing in the night of this new space. Cold shot through his fingers and down his back as he tried to guide himself down the dark hallway. Two or three steps later, a light came on. He looked up and saw a single yellow bulb dangling from a long wire. Down the hallway, a few more lights sparked into being, exposing the hallway, spreading light from bulbs dangling down four or five feet from the ceiling. The light in the hallway dimmed as he descended, cold air continuing to shoot upward. His body shivered in that space as he dropped into what he imagined was the bowels of the school. After about four or so minutes of walking, he came to a large wood door that was slightly ajar. From behind the door, he could hear a large metal machine screaming. Michael tiptoed forward. The door's smooth surface revealed nothing of the intention of the room behind it. He crouched down and leaned forward, looking through the crack in the door from his knees on the floor. What he saw made his mouth drop open. This has been a Talking Pictures Theater presentation of a Screaming Lapel Pin production. The Jane of My Youth, a coming-of-age story of young love. This week, Screaming Lapelpins has on sale the impignorating Kakapu. Pick one up wherever screaming lapel pins are sold. And we're back. KJ, take it away. In round two, we're going to have an additional three questions, each question worth two points. And the categories are the crime, the motive, and the warden. Nick, where would you like to go? I'm going to pick the crime. It's time for question four. What is Frank's crime? Locked in. Locked in. Locked in. He had developed a computer virus that he was going to upload to take down ISN servers. The exact same answer. Computer virus. Excellent. Now, the first time I watched this movie, I completely missed it. Points for everybody. Um, yes, that's why he was in prison. He developed a computer virus that was going to take down computers. Um, so he ended up in, in, in prison. Um, How did you miss it? I, I, I think they kind of, like what Tom was saying before, they, they, they very briefly mention yeah. what it is. It's almost in like, a, a, like in a, an overvoice over something else. It's not, it, it's not blatant. Yeah. It you doesn't know what? matter. <laughs> to be fair, that's something I thought was completely anticlimactic in this film. Because we get to the point where he's like, oh, yeah, it's not me. I'm the wrong guy. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, actually, I was the key guy all along. Number one, I had the killer virus. Okay, great. Did matter. It's about your plight in this prison, in this jail. And, and it takes something away from it, too. Because, the you know, the... It, I don't know. Has anybody read or seen the trial, the Kafka book, and Orson Welles made it into a movie? Actually, Nick, I think you saw it with me. If I did, it was probably a long time ago. With Anthony Perkins, it was a long time ago. It was at your parents' house. It was a a, a double feature of rarely seen Orson Welles movies, which was like our you know our, one of our sexless Saturday nights. Uh, <laughs> well, and to be fair, this might have been very many young. <laughs> Saturday nights. <yeah. laughs> um, but, you know, the idea of, of that book and, and the movie, too, is that Anthony Perkins is being kind of prosecuted and tried 
for something and no one can identify what it is. And so that kind of mounts the absurdity. And so you end up kind of divorcing the crime from the activity of the, the persecution, which is, that, which is what I thought this movie was doing up until he actually reveals that he actually, you know, committed a crime. Um, the, the problem here, and I, I, you know, I didn't want it to be too value judgy about this movie because we, we, we could just go all night then. It is what it is. Yeah, I think the problem with this movie is that the fact that he, we actually know what he did, that it isn't a mistake of the machine, sucks a little bit of energy out of the, out of the mystery of the movie. And it also hurts the theme that we get in the end or the, how we identify the villain in the end, which is this sort of, um, sort of Guantanamo Bay style uh, 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 prison camp, this you know, unconstitutional prison camp. Um, if he's actually done something wrong, that you know, that makes the 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 experience he's having, um, I don't know, less interesting. It, it kind of sucks it, it. It sucks the air out of it a little bit. You like the uh, you know, you got the wrong guy idea, and then all of a sudden it's like actually you got the right guy. I just still don't want to be here. Yeah, and you think after this period of time, he'd be like, okay, I did it. I get it. Can I have my, lo-? you know, like that That would become part of the, the sort of plea for freedom. Well, maybe he was only there three days. Maybe it's back to what I was talking about earlier. That mm-hmm. time is just accelerated in this application that's occurring and being fed into his brain. But I don't want to go back down that road. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, Ross, the remaining categories are the motive and the Warren. Which one would you like to go with? I think we should go to the motive. It's time for question five. How did Frank's father die? Locked in. Locked in. Locked in. I don't know how specific you want to get with this answer, but he was on life support for four years which extended his life four years longer than Frank felt it should have been. And then he passed away. So he was artificially kept alive for four years and then died. He's removed from the life support. That's what kills him. We see it in the, in the flashbacks, flash sideways that he, once you remove that, we see him removed from the life support and this kills him. I had the same as Nick. I didn't recall the life support actually being turned off and I can't remember what the condition was that made him sick initially. But I do recall the life support. I don't know if they mentioned the actual condition. Points for everybody. Yeah, so it, 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 the how is um, on a ventilator for, for four years. Maybe not a ventilator, but that life support system for, for four years. So at this point, now I think we can start to construct the plot of the movie. Okay. It's, it's all the things I've been holding back. It's everything that Nick's been holding back. <laughs> this might be my headcanon, but Frank's upset that a computer kept his father alive for four years, right? Like you said, Nick. Frank makes a computer virus, which is a threat to, well, I don't know, society or something. Frank goes to prison, but they don't know where the computer virus is, but they've narrowed it down to one memory in the cafe, but Frank is resisting letting them know what he did with the computer virus while he was in the cafe. Does that add up? Is that, is that, was that the plot of the movie? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. And we, he does. Can I say about where the computer virus is? Well, he hides it in the picture, which is the opening shot of of the picture of the movie. He hides it behind the painting or the, the photograph. Really? I thought he threw it out in the trash bin. No, he got it from the photograph and then threw it in the trash bin. Mm-hmm. Which was stupid. I know this is getting into movie rant territory, but why would you just put it in the bin? Surely you've got to do something a little bit more thorough to destroy the virus than put it in the bin. Okay, I'm going there now. Are you ready for me to go there? No, no, let's do one more question then we'll do it. <laughs> 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 Let me at him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so listeners, uh, we, we've been struggling answering these questions because of future answer for questions, and, and hopefully this edits out's okay. Um, you won't believe the ferocity these co-hosts are uh, displaying right now. So let's move on to the final question before they jump through the Zoom meeting here. 
It's time for question six. Do you think Frank made it out of prison? Locked, locked in. in. Oh, okay. I'm locked in as well. Locked in. All right, Ross. What do you got? Uh, as I alluded to earlier, I don't believe he did make it out. I think there's enough to suggest that this final escape sequence is yet just another simulation, memory, imaginative sequence from which he could wake up. Um, there's, there's enough there to indicate that. I would say if we make the assumption that he did not escape and is still within this prison, that is the saving grace of this movie's plot. Because if it doesn't end that way, I don't like this movie. If it ends that way, I at least have some reason to have spent the time to watch this movie. So in the final sequence, when he's in the cafe and went through all the trials and tribulations of escaping and all that, he finds the virus, throws it in the bin. We see in the, ca the cafe, the machine, Howard, his machine sticking down, which we had never seen before. And we've seen some scenes where when he's in that dream state, he kind of goes in and out of when he's in the prison versus in the dream state. In fact, there's a certain scene where I think he's embracing or kissing Gabby that we actually see him make those motions in the prison scene. So I'm saying that, you know, it was all a ruse. And in the end, this silly, dumb computer still got its mark and got the information it needed, and he is still in it. I'll even go so far to say that um, when he's processed, okay, they got the information, they have no intent of actually letting him out, but Howard does actually want to at least make him comfortable, and that's why I think the sequence ends that way. Long answer for a short question. He's still in the box. <laughs> I, I think he's free. The The reason being is that the, the evidence that he's still in the box, that he's still trapped in the infinity chamber, is the final shot of a camera, kind of what could be a security camera or what could be Howard. That, I think, is it. Other than we know that he's, you know, that he's been tricked before and that it's, you know, that, that it's something the computer has the capability of doing. Otherwise... That's the only evidence we have is that there's a security camera that might be Howard in that room. The evidence we have that he is free, um, first of all, it's it's the facts of the situation. He goes out there, he meets like a, a man and a kid who escort him or help him when he's in the snow. Um, we have the kind of justification for what actually happened there because clearly there was a meltdown at the prison because they don't have food for these people anymore. We also get the interaction with Gabby, who's no longer Gabby, but Madeline. And also one more, one more bit of evidence, sorry. This is what I was trying to stumble towards, is the tone. You know, you can convey with facts of the plot what is going on. You could also convey with the tone. And the tone is this kind of um, uh, uh, airy, folky guitar song that's being played on the soundtrack as we're watching him and Gabby sit down to, to talk. Oh, also, his clothes are different, right? He's he's changed in a way we've never seen him change before. And so I think all of that on one side of the equation and on the other side is a camera that might be Howard and also could not be Howard. So I'm going to go with that he is free. Wow. So I agree with Nick and Ross that he's stuck in the prison. Tom, your, your answer did present a lot of evidence, and I really liked how you, um, how you brought the tone of the movie in as your evidence that he is free. Um, so points go to you, even though I completely disagree. I, I think he's still in that, that prison. I think seeing that camera, it wasn't important to see that Howard was there. It was important to see that Howard now knows where the virus is. Therefore, he's done with Frank and can either let him go or stop uh, keeping him alive or whatever the camera's off also right this is i mean that that was my reading of seeing the camera there the camera's off the system is smashed well then here's my question so um in the, in the movie they present the the cafe visiting the cafe as a memory so did frank visit that cafe before he got out of prison yes 
and Gabby just doesn't remember him or not Gabby, but you know, Gabby doesn't remember Frank when he goes the second time. If it's seven months or eight months later, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, how many people do you serve coffee to in, in the period of eight months? Possibly he never actually knew her name. If he just made her up to be Gabby in all his memories, she, she might just be the person who serves him some coffee and, and so I agree, there's, there's enough there to suggest that it possibly could go either way. The, the elevator music that is in the cafe in every other scene isn't there at the end. But I believe there is a bit more evidence to suggest, to leave it open to the possibility that he's still in a dream. Those photos on the wall, um, they, well, the, the one that we are focused on the whole time is the tree. And we know he sees that tree in real life during the escape sequence. And the other photos um, are also all things that he sees during the escape sequence. Um, you can watch that back and all the photos on the wall are of scenery and scenes and places as he escapes the prison. So I, I think that's enough to suggest that even the escape sequence still could be something taking place in his imagination. That coupled with the fact that his first escape was so vivid and he got so far all the way to the convenience store before snap, he wakes up um, back in the prison. It kind of uh, makes me feel like even though the final escape and the final scene has the feeling of being much more free and less memory-like, that it could just be getting more and more intricate and he still could wake up. See, at any moment. I hate to say this, but I think KJ fell victim to Tom Smooth talking because um, even in that final sequence, when we're in the cafe and that music tone that we're talking about, if you actually, fortunately, I had the subtitles on of this movie and the music that appears and the dialogue that appears as they show the camera coming onto the screen, it says something about getting pushed back down right where I started. And that's exactly when we see the Howard looking machine in the cafe. So I actually, you know, these episodes are all for fun, but I actually think there's a lot of evidence. And just like Ross said, the first escape, it shows you how limitless this supercomputer can create and design uh, all scenery, people, everything around him to seem so real. So I think that there is actually very strong evidence that he's still in there, but that's what's so great about these type of movies is that Tom can prevent such great evidence in one direction. I can prevent such great evidence in another direction. And unless we actually look up what the director said he was trying to accomplish, we can all have fun really, you know, talking about all this. But also we, as viewers get evidence, get information in a way that Frank is not receiving information. We're in the, we're in the chair as audience again. We were given the the voiceovers of the newspaper uh, of the newscasters talking about the situation of the prison. Now, th this could be something Frank sees or or Frank hears, but we learn the information um, in a at a time or in a way that Frank doesn't. This is, I think, the only time that that happens. Right? We get the newscasters in voiceover, but you don't think that was Howard. You don't think Howard was injecting that into Frank's mind so that Frank would be more comfortable and more willing to let them know where the virus is? I think that's just to speed up the ending, but you're right. You're right from an audience perspective as we're viewing this. Yeah. So as you're sitting in the snow, you start hearing newscasters speak into your head and you think, well, I'm in the real world now. <laughs> I, I mean, it's possible that he, he found that information out in, this, in, a, in a virtual world. However, we are never, as audience, in a position um, either seeing things from Frank's perspective or seeing into Frank's room, into the, the infinity chamber. That would be the one time in which we get the subjective experience of Frank given to us in a way that is separated from Frank himself. So we would get an aspect of Frank's consciousness delivered to us external to frank's consciousness right that that's a little but the challenge here and this, is, this is something that and i won't speak for ross because i don't know his interpretation on this but this goes back to me where we're still talking about is the infinity chamber a physical space 
if it's not a physical space, it can be piped directly into his brain. If he's like his father who was on life support, except Frank is in a prison in his own mind, then all this other exposition and voiceover could be brought directly to the source. So that's why I, I, I'm pretty strongly feeling about this because one, I think it's the only thing that's giving me a saving grace to this movie because if it ends the way you're proposing it ends, I'm much less interested in this movie. <laughs> so I'm hoping that my interpretation and for me to, my maximize, to maximize my enjoyment, I'm looking at it from this lens. But I do, I do think that this may not be a physical prison. And in that sense, all of this can be explained. The changing of clothes, the everything. It's just what can your mind think? But uh, I mean, we don't have any evidence of that. That's the problem, right? This, this they is bring up getting... the father. They bring up the father for a reason. But they, they... tied to a machine for longer than he should have been. Yeah, this is, but, but Frank is tied to a machine for longer than he should have been, right? That doesn't tell us something ontological. Yeah, well, I mean, that doesn't tell us something necessary. He might still be, but the fact that Frank's father is tied to a machine doesn't tell us something ontological. It tells us something thematic. That, you know, we are too bound to, um, we are too bound to these machines that are, are that consciousness is, is something unique, um, that it's something that can't be replicated by machines and tying it to machines can have kind of damaging properties. What's so disappointing about Howard is despite his, you know, IR 12 AG six status is that he's actually fairly limp as a consciousness. He's able to circle through um, prompts of speech, but generally he is not a, a self thinking computer or, or, you know, or at least he's very rudimentarily. So while well, Frank is, is a fully fleshed out human. And so to say that um, Howard uh, for all his ability to create a, uh, a false world that our consciousness can spread or Frank's consciousness can spread out in um, it isn't to say that, that our consciousness is, I don't know, bound to the machine or Frank's father's body, his life is bound to this machine that that has any kind of implication for how this world is actually structured. It seems more, more thematic to me. But the challenge here is you're making different assumptions. I make the assumption that Howard's demeanor and delivery is all a ruse, where you're taking it as fact. And that's where we're going into a different interpretation, where I'm saying the supercomputer's powers are limitless. You're saying the abilities are finite, which brought you to your conclusion. Oh, I don't have overwhelming evidence or even really great evidence to suggest that everything is a ruse, that Frank is still in the machine. I have decent evidence, not great evidence, but decent evidence to suggest that he's not in the machine. And this idea that Frank, Frank is like his dad and that the, even the room is not real, that the whole thing is a projection of a consciousness. We, I don't think we have any evidence of that. Well, this should uh, definitely lead to an interesting discussion in Movie Rant. And we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Hi, this is Nick from Talking Pictures Trivia, here to give you a 60-second summary of Infinity Chamber from the perspective of lead protagonist Frank Lerner. Oh no, I'm in the Infinity Chamber. How'd I get here? I don't know. I'm the wrong guy. Quote Computer Warden Howard. I do not have that information. Primary objective, keep you alive. I really don't want to be in the Infinity Chamber. Maybe I should work with Gabby and my subconscious to come up with an escape plan. Oh wait, she's my girlfriend now. 12 seconds to escape, and I'm out. Oh no, it's all a ruse. I'm still in the infinity chamber. Time passes. No more food or drinks. Help me, Howard, even though I was the right guy who made a virus to take down the system after all. I escape. Or do I? Let's leave it ambiguous. Infinity Chamber, directed by Travis Malloy. And we're back. Ready? Fight. It's time for Movie Rand. Um, without wanting to repeat myself too much, I really can't move past those photos on the wall and the evidence they provide that there, there must be something um, imaginary or surreal about his escape sequence. How much of a coincidence could it be that these photos on the wall from this coffee shop that he's apparently been to at some point in his past are all scenes that he encounters as he escapes through the snow and makes his way back to civilization. 
it's it's too much of a coincidence. I agree that there's enough happening in the film and enough changes to that final scene to make us give us the feeling of having escaped the matrix, as it were. But but I also just think there's enough evidence there to suggest even if you think you're out of the simulation, that could just be the simulation being at its most convincing. Yeah, I, I'm trying to pull up the file to see what those those photographs looked like because I don't I don't particularly that might be the evidence that that secures it. Um, I know in terms of the the plot, what it would be is he's gone to that coffee house, he was shot there or, or tasered there and taken away. That's where he's been trapped. Uh, that's where he was trapped. And the reason why that coffee house is important and why our our good friend Howard keeps sending him back there is to find out where the the device is, right? The the virus on the, the USB is. If those photographs, I, you know, I, I don't remember those details particularly well, but if those photographs are actually of um are of what like the snow scene that he escaped to or the desert scene the desert scene could still work in the sense that he's imagining in it so it's it's whatever a photograph he saw that is then generated by howard into uh, into a, a false landscape um if they're replicating the snowscape though then that might be the evidence but you would have to be a replication of one particular scene which is that snowscape the one photo where where focused on is the one with that that single tree i think in the photo it's a bit of a lake and then he encounters it with, with snow blanket in front of it but yeah i believe the other photos as well are, are doing the same thing there are things that he encounters which suggests that the escape sequence itself may just be a figment of his imagination i actually mm -hmm. Disagree with Nick because I I do in terms of not liking the plot if it is true that he escapes because I, I I like the idea of escaping the matrix or breaking free from the shackles of the simulation but I really like that there's enough left dangling in this film that you never really know if he has and perhaps there's enough there that makes me think he probably hasn't but the unsuspecting viewer might believe he has. I'm going to bring up two items just because uh, it's fun. <laughs> the one of them is quite straightforward. What is the title of this film? The title of this film is Infinity Chamber, which implies it is endless and doesn't end. Now that's just for fun. But one of the other things I did want to bring up in that uh, cafe sequence, and I, I briefly started going down this path when we were on a break uh, with Ross, but one of the things that made me feel that that cafe scene was another manipulation is in addition to that song that I was mentioning uh, when the camera, um, the Howard looking camera is, is shown in the cafe at that same sequence, it happens right after he discards the virus. So in the assumption that he is still in a simulation or still in prison or whatever we want to call it, because there's many levels here, the computer, the agency has now found out where the real virus is, if this is not the real one. So him discarding it in the trash doesn't matter because they're going to go to the real coffee shop and get the real virus and make sure it's destroyed. In that same sequence, when he, uh, when Frank is, is sitting down there with the lady now referred to as Madeline, you'll notice that the camera is turned the other direction. At every other point, the only time that the camera turns away is when it was not interested. So at this point, the, the supercomputer, the Howard, has received its objective. And of course, this person is a very violent offender against their cause. They're not going to let him go, but they're not going to torment him anymore either. So this is when I think he is still caught in their matrix as its own type of prison. Again, KJ likes to use the word headcanon uh, from time to time, but I don't know if this is just my manipulation of what I've seen or what I want it to be, but I actually really think there's a, a good argument for it. And I do think there is some evidence. Right. So I'm, I just pulled up the movie. I was looking at the, the photographs there. It's not a so snowscape. That photograph that the, the thing is hidden behind is, it appears to be a, I can't see the other photographs in it, but it appears to be 
no snow on the ground. I think it's just a woodland woodland scene. Get out of here. I thought it was exactly that escape, like Ross was saying. That was that was my understanding as well. That's that's I don't see any snow on that ground. I don't, you know. It's I'm, I believe it's the same tree, but perhaps seasonally different from the escape. So because mm-hmm. there's that scene where he's staring at the tree and then all of a sudden it zooms out to the cafe and we see it's the same tree as in the photo. Is that did you see yeah. that thing? No, I, I'm. I'm I actually have it up now. I'm actually looking at. I just paused <laughs> the 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 movie. This is the first time I'm talking picture trivia where we're going back to the videotape to confirm or deny. No, I uh, <laughs> Ross has a very good point because the lower image is the wind uh, uh, wind harvesting turbines. Okay. The other and that was the first escape. Yeah, yep. that's the desert escape. Yeah. And there is one that looks like the landscape of the desert escape. There is the woodland one, which again, these are black and white images, so we can't really see. And it looks on the top left that there may be snow capped on those. But again, this is black and white images. So, and I'm looking, you know, at a, at a still from a, a movie. Yeah, but there's, there's no snow in it, is there? It could be snow because that top left one you can't tell because it's grayscale. It's 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 black and white. But I can tell you the turbines. I mean that's like very specific. Okay, I'm looking at the scene now where he just gets out onto the snow. The desert's drawn from his subconscious. No, but the desert is the image on the right. Yeah, but the the desert is still drawn from his his subconscious. Right, he's not escaping. Sorry, just because we know he wakes up from that desert escape. The top left one again is debatable if that is snow co- covered. The top left one, it's it's just you can't like it's, it's mountainous, it's white, it's. Yeah, I don't see. I'm watching this sequence. I don't see the the lake or river. The river, and tree. the the lake, river. The the water one is the bottom right. The the la- Well, I'm talking about the picture that he's he's looking at, right? Oh, there's yeah, the tree. Okay. The middle picture. Yeah, he stops yeah, yeah. and sees the tree. Yeah. Okay. So, there's, I mean, there's some evidence there that it'll be in a different season, possibly. Ross, Ross is right. When he looks at that tree, it cuts to the black and white picture. So there is this idea that the, the black and white picture is, is representing um, this scene, right? Which, which would probably be the best evidence because those pictures, which he seems to have seen in, in the real world, um, at least one of them was used to generate the the desert scape, the fake desert scene. There's also a high, the one on the middle, I just got a better view mm. uh, from a different scene. The one on the middle um, l- left is the highway with the power lines when you need the gas station. The top left one is definitely looks like more of like a snow capped mountain. Yeah, I, the, the, the evidence has to be for that last scene because we know the desert scene is generated by Howard and probably generated in conjunction with Frank's subconscious. I'm so saying the, the top uh, left, top left. Okay. Top I, I don't left. have that. Oh, okay. Sure, top the, 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 the snow cat. It looks like yeah. snow on the mountains. And... But the best evidence is the evidence. I think Ross that you brought forward, which is the, the filmmaker points to that tree as being the tree in the picture. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. And the guy's face kind of falls. So I think there's more, that, that's the best evidence I've seen for your guys' position. Something that confused me uh, a little bit was if the plot of the film is that he was the creator of a virus, he was part of an alliance that was fighting back against the regime, why was he so um, unaware of the AI of Howard when he was first in the cell? Is this meant to just be him pretending he doesn't understand what's going on? Um, because we find out later on that he's actually really clued in. He knows all the different computer systems. He can tell Howard which version Howard is. Um, but he, he seems genuinely confused by the situation he finds himself in at the start. How is that the case? If he if he is some mastermind that, that is trying to bring the system down. He figures it out pretty quickly, doesn't he? Uh, no, I'm with Ross. He, he starts thinking it's another person until he starts that Howard, Howard, Howard. And if if you're a guy writing a virus that's going to take down the world, you you mm-hmm. got to be constantly thinking, is there a guy behind that or is there a computer behind that? I, I mean, he woke up in the middle of, you know, I mean, think about the condition. It's going to be like waking up out of surgery you didn't know you had, 
right? Let's say you're drinking coffee and then you wake up in that room and somebody's talking to you. Your first thought wouldn't be, oh no, the supercomputer, you know, it wouldn't be for me anyway. He wakes up with the bandage on his hand, but where does he hurt his hand? I feel like he hurt his hands when he whacked Howard to try to alert the security systems, but that happens later in the sequence. So it makes me suggest that him first waking up in the chamber might just be one of many iterations of him waking up that yeah that confused me yeah i I agree with you there ross that that's that my first question was how long do you guys think he was there because i think he was there way longer than the movie presented I, i the first time he wakes up i don't think that was the beginning of his imprisonment i i don't know at this point because looking over that last scene the um it's not cnn but cnn like you know i analogy uh that is reporting on what happened is also actually taken from a a pov it's somebody lying in bed with his dog we presume this is frank looking at the the thing so i i'm not really sure i mean i think there's evidence that that indicates you know we don't know i would imagine that when we first meet him is when he first figures out he's in this room i'm going to go back to our wonderful debate on did he escape or did he not escape? And the internet is a very valuable resource. And one of the things I found here, a lot of the internet actually does think that he's still in it, but that's not fact, okay? So there was an interview with Travis Malloy about the ending. And he actually says, it's not a BS answer, but his true intentions were to create an ending that allowed the audience to decipher their own meaning and to take resolution as they believed. So he actually meant to plant evidence in both directions so that we could have this fun and fierce debate um, about this movie. So he actually does not definitively say one way or the other what it is. However, the internet hive in general thinks it actually was the escape. But if we go right back down to the director, it's open to interpretation. So I, I will say there is evidence in both camps but I still like my version. <laughs> well, let's, can, can I ask, what is the uses of that ambiguity as opposed to jumping on one side or the other? How does that ambiguity help us? What does it tell us about the, you know, what's going on in this movie or the nature of the things this movie is attempting to tackle? Well, we're going to have Travis Malloy as our next guest for <laughs> so we'll ask I, It's going to be another 20 <laughs> years till he directs a movie, so I think he's got time. It's a, clever way, it's a clever way of doing a lot with very little. You know, if you can you know, create the film on such a low budget and yet, yeah, leave it so open to discussion and debate and different theories about what happened, I suppose that's, you know, that's not a bad idea. Okay, I'd like to present some weak evidence that he did not escape. And here it is. Previously on the show, you guys mentioned Gabby and the performance. Uh, Nick suggested it might have been dubbed. Tom said, that's all she could do. That's because it was Hal creating that, not Hal. (laughs) That's because it was (laughs) Howard creating that performance. And that's the proof that he never got out. Gabby's performance. I think there's, there's a chance there. I mean, I didn't know if it was yeah. a stylistic choice say, or if it was just the actress or mm-hmm. budgetary concern because he did this on a shoestring budget. Mm. So do we have the number on the budget for this one? I think it was around, I'm going to say I read something about 120000 Yeah, I know it yeah. was extremely low budget because I was looking at something where even the set, he was saying that he literally made the background with like plastic crates that are used to carry soda. Like everything was bare bones, which I think we picked up on fairly quickly in this movie but it was very very low budget minor point minor point of uh clarification is howard updated at some stage during the movie or is he just rebooted because i was i was trying to be on point when i watched this film and i noticed little things in case they were questions did anyone notice that the flavors of water changed halfway through the movie I don't think so. Did they, they? They certainly did. They were. Ci- they did. Citrus, oh, orange, right. tropical that. berry. Then they changed to citrus lime, orange, tropical. <gasps> yeah, yeah. Because I remember the only reason I picked that up is 
I was listening to, and I remembered one of the first ones was Barry. And when he went through the list again, Barry was not part of that list. So I didn't get to that granularity. Just to clarify, uh, Russ, you were pretty much very close to being spot on. The budget was 125000 That's actually an extremely low budget. Yeah. So I that's, think they, I think I was right. I think they just had really uh, cheap boom mics. And that's why that actress's voice uh, was off. I'm hoping for her sake. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, I, I think that's what they could afford. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, like, so I, I hate the ambiguous ending that sparks the conversation of is it or isn't it? Uh, Inception does this, and I, I thought it was idiotic. Um, however, in the spirit of generosity, I, I, I think if we're to, to look at the, what this movie's about, which seems to be the nature of consciousness, the nature of being aware and um, the idea of consciousness as seemingly as a way to connect on the world and to have freedom in the world, but also we're sort of the, the prisoners of our own consciousness. Um, I, I think the ambiguity kind of reflects the, you know, the sort of harder problem of consciousness. You know, there's a philosopher, David Chalmers, who talks about this. He calls it the hard problem of consciousness, which is that, um, that we can't really explain subjective experience we might be able to in the the easy problem of consciousness explain um uh, uh, neuroscience and the that kind of process but how you detail subjective experience becomes you know extraordinarily difficult if not impossible i mean some people suggest it's just not something we can do and i think the ambiguity of this ending if i'm going to be be kind to this film uh, uh, brought up that that train of thought or, or that discussion. So this may be one of the few details of this interpretation that I agree with Tom on in the fact that I also dislike when movies don't have a definitive purpose. I think it's kind of sloppy and I think it's kind of a cop out. I, I actually would have preferred for his interview to say that I'm wrong and that Tom's interpretation was correct versus the Eh, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, it's cheap, right? It's it's cheap yeah. ambiguity. My reading of this, and this is a pretty standard reading. It's you know kind of like the Matrix reading of this, is that this is, um, you know, first of all, there's that kind of uh, uh, Buddha thing of, of of escaping the kind of the physical world, um, but it's also the the Cartesian demon aspect. Do we, you know that from the the meditations? where um, you know, Descartes talks about we don't know or we don't have any kind of guaranteed empirical evidence that we are not kind of brains in a vat, right? This is, this is the matrix. This is the plot of the matrix, is everyone's a brain in a vat. Um, and I, I think that comes in and that the, the kind of sense perceptions we have are just plugs that a, you know, a, a demon is putting into the kind of the consciousness of of the you know whatever individual whatever brain is in the vat and that was kind of my reading of this it's sort of like this this kind of buddhist um you know escape from the flesh type thing overlapping this kind of cartesian demon approach to to consciousness i was wondering what people thought of that not related to that question but i was gonna say while you were going through that all i thought of was cypher and uh, i think his name was cypher in matrix i should have taken the blue pill <laughs> he just didn't want to know yeah. <laughs> so so tom um so i'm trying to think in, in terms of the senses howard certainly brings up taste with the the coffee and the the tropical berry and all these things um he, he definitely brings up sound when he says hey i can do music um they kind of have that that gas that knocks them out. I don't know if that's a sense. Um, th does he do them all? I guess I'm just trying to. The smell is the gas. I guess okay. Let's let's make that stretch. The gas can be the smell. Vision. Does Howard do anything visually for? No, that's all he does is view. Well, that would be at least the desert scene. We could all agree that that is well, a visual. Well, that's the whole gamut, right? That's all the senses. That's not specifically sight. I mean, it's sight, sound, smell, presumably, yeah. right? I mean, um. So I'm just trying to think, does Howard go through all the senses? Um, I don't even know the ones I'm missing here. How many are there? Five? Yeah. Sight, uh, sight, um, touch, taste, hearing, and smell. 
Okay. And then the touch, you could argue when uh, Frank wants to attack Howard, it is a very, you know, Frank reaches out and touches Howard. I don't know. Maybe this isn't, maybe this is too literal with um, what you were talking about with the Buddhism and the, the cart demon. Oh, well, if, if he is a brain in a van, right? Like if we imagine the, I'm also talking somewhat metaphorically because what we have here is, you know, it's his physical body, right? Frank is in a room, his body is in a room. But if we think of him um, as what's happening here is that this is a, a brain in a vat who experiences a reality generated by a computer. He goes into this thing, right? There's a machine that, you know, Howard thinks is a ventilator possibly, but, you know, tends, sends him into a, a, an alternate reality. Um, what we have here then is... Uh, a, a situation in which we don't necessarily have evidence of a stable consciousness. Now, I don't think the infinity chamber itself is, you know, a, a generated, um, is a subconscious state. I think it's something Howard's in, but I, I do think it operates as a metaphor for the kind of Cartesian problem of how do we know there is the physical outside of the mental? Uh, which is what the pro you know, and what our, our discussion or a little debate at the end um, also reveals that it's really what this movie shows us is that that answer isn't exactly forthcoming. We, you know, it's really hard to, to determine can we ever actually be brains out of the vat? Are we isolated in our own hallucinations? Um, Going back to your senses, in my broader interpretation of Howard or whatever the true supercomputer is behind all this simulation is at play, in that case, it is a master manipulator of all the senses because it has almost unlimited scope. There's no glitch in this matrix, okay? It does things as it plans to do them. So I, I think that may show you the the depth and breadth of that in tom's interpretation where it's a physical space then i'm not exactly sure well and i tend to agree like when he's walking through the desert yeah absolutely I mean, it's the matrix so to say but i was just wondering does the director highlight the senses outside of that so not all at once but is he showing us okay here's where i, I want to highlight that he's going to taste something he's going to smell something he's going to see something um I don't, I don't know that the director does that. That, that might not be worth exploring. Yeah, I, I mean, he goes into the cafe. I, I don't think it's necessarily that the director is highlighting the smell of coffee or the taste of coffee, right? Um, I think what, what Howard is experiencing, and I think the director is highlighting this, but excuse me, not Howard, but Frank is experiencing is real intimacy, right? And it is as real to him as any other intimate relationship might be. Um, and it, it's kind of devastating. And even there, there's actually a phys, an odd physical or an odd shot that, that, that buttresses this interpretation. After he leaves, we see a cut of Gabby wearing just a T-shirt in the infinity chamber alone. Which leads me to think that it's not a physical space. That just my, I'm not saying the right or wrong, but that's, yeah. that's why I took it as... It's not a physical space because she's not there, mm. but he can also manipulate. So anyway. Yeah. Or, or it could just be the director making a comment, right? I mean, it's, it's a little fuzzy, but I think the, the nature of Frank's consciousness is also fuzzy. Well, Tom, I think he left it ambiguous on purpose for us to have this interpretation. I yeah. actually think my enjoyment of the movie just went down after I read that he purposely left it open ended. <laughs> Yeah, I I know it's kind of it's, it's kind of silly, but if we could if we could do the the generous thing yeah, yeah. And, and and try and regain our yeah. our you know our pleasure yeah just, just I was let pumped him... I was pumped on my interpretation <laughs> but yeah I th I think that the experience with Gabby is as substantial and real as any relationship and even their debates where it becomes like well you know you you couldn't be. Uh, you couldn't be a pushover, right? You know, because I'm I'm inventing you or I'm creating you. Um, that seems to cut against his actual experience, which is this is a real person who I'm I'm engaging with. So I, I think that's the sensation that is you know as real as reality. 
Well, KJ, uh, while our feelings may have been mixed about the actual movie, there was a great amount of discussion and interpretation from it. So I think this actually was a, a really good pick for us to discuss today. Being a good sport, I'm going to congratulate Tom for winning this week. So congratulations, Tom, on your wonderful interpretation of this film. I'd also like to thank uh, Ross for joining us today. It was great to have you here. Thanks very much. It was an absolute pleasure. Awesome. I'd like to also thank our potentially simulated editor, KJ, who masterfully crafts these episodes. Also, I'm going to acknowledge IMDb, which is a great resource for movie information. Check out our website, TalkingPicturesTrivia.com, for more information about us and our episodes. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, and Stitcher, as well as our YouTube channel. We are extremely grateful for any positive reviews, as those help others like you find us. If you like what you hear, remember to like and subscribe to our show. Join us next time when we discuss Tom's recommendation from 2006, Marie Antoinette. Should be a fun one. Looking forward to it. See you then. Ding, 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 ding. Join us next time when we discuss Tom's recommendation from 2006, Mary Antoinette. Looking forward to it. See you then. Cool. Is it Mary or Marie? Marie. Ah! That last line again. <laughs> it's Mary Antoinette hey, Mary. from the Bronx. <laughs> I was from the Bronx. She runs a bakery. <laughs> Marie. I knew it was Marie. Too. I was like, just get through it. Okay. Join us next time when we discuss Tom's recommendations. <laughs> Let's try what, that again. The French Revolution or something? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to cut a head off. <laughs> Get the guillotine out of here. It's not my style. <laughs>